All right, well, good morning. Um, <clears throat> as Brandon said, Julie and I have been here and really counted a privilege for the last seven years. Um, <clears throat> it's pretty much unheard of in student ministry. Um, and so I just want to begin this morning by saying thank you from, from the bottom of my heart that um, as a church you have loved my family well and you have been able to uh, allow me to provide for them while um, serving as God is called. So really appreciate that. Really looking forward to the change. Um, my minor in undergrad was in missions, so it's something I'm passionate about, something I'm excited about as well. Uh, and, and New Life is already such a passionate church for the community. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to being able to, to really take, and ultimately it's not about me or about New Life, but it's about the name of Jesus. So looking forward to that and, and the opportunities that that's going to bring. With that being said, <clears throat> I'm not sure how someone who's a decade older than me calls me old, but I guess it takes an old person to know an old person. So, um, no, uh, three years ago, our daughter will be three in this January, and, um, you know, I remember when Kate was born, and I'm thinking, man, like, I've got to raise this kid, I've got to teach them all, all these things. How many of you who have kids realize that your kids may teach you as much or more than you teach them? All right, <clears throat> and so I've come to the realization of that over the past few years, and, um, one of the things that my daughter has been teaching me over the past few years has been, or I guess reteaching me, has been about wonder. Now, as we get to be old, apparently, and, and we lose the ability to wonder. You know, it, it never fails. Every night, my daughter will say, look at the moon, Daddy. She's just amazed by it. It's the same moon in the same place, looking out the same truck window in the same spot in the driveway. And yet she never fails to see it for the amazing thing that it is. Um, God bless my in-laws. Um, they watch my kids throughout the week. And my mother-in-law used to have this really nice stand of, of flowers and rose bushes and stuff. They look considerably worse because now Kate walks by every day and pulls petals off and takes them with her. Right? Because she's amazed by it. She, she wonders at it. And I realize that the word wonder is a little bit archaic. It's a little bit old. Like, when's the last time you heard somebody say, well, that's just wonderful? If it was recently, it's because, probably because you were watching TV land, right? And, and one of the mothers said, well, that's just so wonderful, right? We, we don't use that word anymore. It's not something that we hear. And, and so what does, what does wonder mean? Well, if you look it up, it says, a feeling of surprise mingled with admiration caused by something beautiful, unexpected, unfamiliar, or inexplicable. It, it's being awestruck. And for most of us, we're awestruck when we look at creation. Maybe it's the Grand Canyon. Or you look at the Grand Canyon and you think, man, that, that, that's magnificent. And you just stand there. Or some, for some of you, uh, so I'm not a beach person, I hate sand, but some of you it's the ocean, right? You go and you sit and you just look and you're just amazed at the expanse and, and the waves. And, and what really strikes me is that we can sit in wonder of the creation and yet be so indifferent about the creator. And so I chose this morning to talk about the wonder of Jesus because I think it's something that as adults we have lost that our children can teach us. That's important because ultimately the only thing worthy of that level of admiration is Jesus Christ. And so as believers... We've got to get back to the place where we can sit in captive awe of Jesus. Some of us, that may be the first time. And so I want to start out in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And we're going to see this word in <clears throat> pretty quickly. And so here Isaiah is prophesying about the coming child. And in verse 6 it says, For unto us a child is born and a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders, and his name shall be called what? Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Of the increase of His government and of peace there will be no end on the throne of David and over His kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. There's a lot of descriptions about Jesus in that passage and yet it starts with wonderful. Why? Because not only is Jesus unexplainable. He's worthy of all of our admiration. And now, I just want to be perfectly honest here. We could talk about the things that make Jesus worthy of wonder 
for a year and never cover them. Now, obviously, they've given me 30 minutes, so we're going to have to pick a few of those. And so we're going to go through this morning. I'm going to pick three things that I think that we need to refocus on that will help us see Jesus for the way that he is. But before we get there, I just want to throw two things out there. The first thing is that um, I had a pastor tell me one time when I was much younger that he thought the most successful thing that Satan ever did was convince a world he didn't exist. And I think that's probably true. And, and, and I'm going to say, you know, that was his greatest feat in the 1900s. I think the best thing he's ever, or the best thing for him he's ever done in the 2000s and going into 2020 is to make us so busy that we don't have time for Jesus. Because here's the thing about wonder. I see the same moon every day that my daughter sees. The difference is she's looking for it and I'm just assuming that it's always there. And so we're going to have to stop And realize that busyness, and this is something ministry has taught me, and I'm sure many of you can relate. Busyness does not always equal productivity. There's always more stuff that I can do, but that doesn't mean I should always be doing the more stuff. All right, Mary and Martha, sometimes we should just stop and sit at the feet of Jesus. And so if we're going to recognize the wonder and the majesty of Jesus, we've got to stop. And to to frame all of this, I would like to, to... quote Paul in Colossians 1.17. He's talking about Jesus and he said, and he is before all things and in him all things hold together. So not only is Jesus before everything, but the way the world works, the fact that it exists, the fact that you and I exist, the fact that your spouse and your children exist, they are because of Jesus. And as we'll read later in scripture, they are for Jesus. Jesus is not just something, Jesus is everything. And so that's the mindset and the perspective that we need to get into as we go into 2020. And so I would say, if you're a summary statement person before we get started, until Jesus is the greatest thing that I can see, I have not seen him correctly or completely. And so that's where we're headed this morning. We're going to try, try and get ourselves into a place, whether it's for the first time or the millionth time, that Jesus is the greatest thing I have ever seen in my life. And so, again, tons of these, but three aspects about the wonder of Jesus. And so if you're taking notes this morning, whether you've got a note sheet or you're taking it on your phone in the app, your first point, the, the wonder of the person of Jesus. This is one of the greatest struggles historically for the church. In fact, nearly every heretical idea involves the person of Jesus, whether it's ancient or modern. They're getting that part wrong. And why is that? Because it makes no sense. If you really stop and think about it, there is no reason that the person of Jesus should be a thing. And yet, that's exactly what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, that the things of the, of the Spirit are foolish to those who are not of the Spirit. Let me, let me explain. So... What you have is Jesus, creator, who decides to become the creation that he created to save a people who rejected him and would ultimately kill him. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. I am going to what? I am going to leave a perfect relationship in heaven where everybody from the world wants to get to go where? To the world to save the people who broke the world in the first place from the way that I made it. That doesn't make any sense. That's crazy, and yet that's exactly what we have when we think about the person of Jesus. It's what John chapter 1, starting in verse 1, says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made what through Him, and without Him not anything that was made was made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. And then if you jump to verse 14, it tells us, And that Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as the only son from the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Now, theologically, these terms are the incarnation of Jesus and the condescension of Jesus. So if you want to impress your friends, you can now throw those out there. Those are really big words for the fact that Jesus went from king to created of his own choice. Why would you do that? 
And then the way that he got here, the virgin birth. How many of you guys know somebody who has had a baby that's a virgin? Nobody, right? It happened once. It's in the book. It, it doesn't make sense. And so scientifically, we can't explain it. And so for some people, that's a struggle. Well, I can't explain why Jesus would do this, or I can't explain how it happened. And, and I get that because I'm a, I'm a detail person. I like to know how things work. I like to know how to fix things. And I like to know how to explain things. But let me just reassure you that the inability to explain it doesn't necessarily change it. You know some other things as of 2019 that science can't explain? Why we yawn? They have no idea. Or why it's contagious. But none of you are going to say, well, yawning doesn't exist. That's not a real thing. Or how about the fact that humpback whales, who were originally solitary animals, they now live in pods. Marine biologists have no idea about that. They just know it's happening. Or, why do cats purr? They, have no, they know how. They just don't know why. Me, personally, I think it's the evil leaving their bodies because, you know, there's no good cat. But never, never mind that. But all of these things that we can... So, the fact that it's unexplainable, to me, makes it all the more worth stopping to wonder at. Because when I can't explain something, that causes me to stop and to take a pause and to appreciate it for what it is. Maybe another fact with regard to the person of Jesus is, do you know that when you talk about all the religions of the world, our religion, Christianity, Jesus is the only God that says, you can't get to me, so I'm coming to you. Every other religion says work harder and try to do better. And Jesus says, you can't get here, so I'm coming to you. The only one. When things are that unique, when things are that different, it should cause us to stop. But I do want to caution. We're not, we don't want to stop and wonder in, in, in the man that Jesus became, right? So I'm going to shatter some of your illusions right now. You know like the picture of Jesus where he's turned like this and he's a white guy with flowing locks of hair and a nicely trimmed beard? That's not what Jesus looked like. Okay? I know for some of you like, that's the only picture you've ever seen. Trust me, Jesus was not a white dude of European descent with sandy hair and a nice trimmed beard. He was probably a Middle Eastern guy. Dark skin, short, Dark hair, most likely had a beard. But there was nothing remarkable about him. In fact, that's exactly what Scripture tells us in Isaiah 53, that there was nothing about the physical appearance of Jesus that would have drawn you to him. He was just an average-looking guy. Maybe he had acne problems. I don't know. But we're not standing in wonder at the man that Jesus became, but the fact that he became a man at all. Because ultimately, in the person of Jesus, Scripture tells us we see God the Father himself. That's what Colossians, the rest of Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20 actually tell us. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and what? And for him. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile, to make himself all things. <clears throat> Whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Now there's some things that you would pick up in Greek that you miss in the English here. So I'm going to kind of tie those together for you. What Paul is doing is he's taking a chunk of Scripture and he's saying, here's proof that Jesus is not only creator but sovereign over creation. Now, here's proof that we can tie them together and Jesus is also sovereign over resurrection and salvation through the person of Jesus. And you can see that like verse 15 and 18 where it talks the phrase, who is, is tying together Jesus' priority as creator over creation Exactly with his leadership of the church and his triumph over death. Paul is saying that's the same person. The same God who created is the person who triumphed over death. 15 and 18 also talk about the firstborn. 
He is the inheritance. He is the first. And then 16 and 19 ties it together with saying, For by him or for in him, for in him all things were created and all things can be saved. And then the final phrase, in heavens and earth, there's nothing anywhere that's outside of his control, even death and salvation and eternity. That's all tied together right here in the person of Jesus. We should stop and marvel that it, it happened at all. And that leads us kind of into our second reason that we should wonder at Jesus, and that's the passion of Jesus. You know, we like to tell stories of the miracles of Jesus and the things that he did, and, and those things were important and they proved who he was, but Jesus came for one reason, to die. Did you ever, did you ever stop and think about that? For us, we try to live as long as possible. And yet Jesus became creation with the sole purpose of dying. That's confusing to me. And so it causes me to stop and to think. You know, I was scrolling through Facebook, wasting time the other day, and I came across this thing that, that really struck me, and it said, Christmas is proof that God isn't afraid to enter our mess. And the way that he did that was through the passion of Jesus, which came through the person of Jesus. Without God being willing to enter the mess, you know where we find ourselves? Still stuck in the mess. Now, I don't know how many of you are, are like numbers and money and financially oriented people. I'm definitely that. Listen, I grew up, my mom's a banker. It's been my whole life. I mean, like, she was making me put back a third of my income when I was like six, getting $10 in allowance. It's just been my life. And, and even more so now, um, my wife and I took financial peace. So if, plug for that for next year. You should definitely get involved with that. Um, she may be even more so the money and budgeting person now than I am. She's all about it. Um, but but I, I think of salvation, of the passion of Jesus, a lot of times in, in, in a financial perspective. And let me explain. Because God is the debt holder. You and I owe a debt to God. One that we cannot pay. And so here's the amazing thing. The debt holder, God, comes to earth and pays our debt to himself at a great personal cost to himself. Don't miss that, right? Because it, on earth, maybe you get a gracious debt holder and they forgive your loan. Well, it really didn't cost them anything. But God paid the full price to satisfy the debt that you owed back to him. That doesn't happen. That's not the way debt works. Regardless of what the government wants to tell you about your student loans right now. It's not the way that debt works. And yet that's exactly how it happened. So what am I saying? All that God is came to earth and died on the cross for you. You know, it, it, I think maybe it's time we stop making the sacrifice of Jesus so corporate. Yes, he died for everyone, but you know who he died for? Me. He died for you. And when you think about it, I don't know that I can reason out coming to a people who had rejected me historically for years, knowing full well that all they're going to do is kill me, and doing all that for their immediate and eternal good. And that, that, that's exactly what Jesus Christ did. He said, you hate me, and yet, I'm coming to you so you can be with me. Because that's what is good. Reminds me of a, of a church. They were just a little church out in the country, and there was a, a young pastor there. And he introduced someone who was visiting, a much older gentleman, and brought him up on stage. And the older gentleman started into a story about a time when a father who was rather accomplished at sailing took his son and his son's friend out on a boat on the ocean, and they were having a good time. And as, do, as, as happens occasionally, a storm came up unexpectedly, and um, 
it was rather violent and actually capsized their boat. And so the father got the boat back over, a small boat, um, and he realized that he only had time to save one of the two boys, either his son or his son's friend. And so his father, in that, the father in that moment, decided to save the son's friend. And he called out to his son and said, Son, I love you, because he knew that his son was a Christian. And he threw the rope to the boy and pulled him in. And all the while, there's these two boys in the audience. They're listening intently. And as, as the story ends and they begin to leave, the two boys come up to the older gentleman and say, That's a really great story, but it doesn't seem probable. And the old man says, You're right, it's not probable, but you should ask your pastor, for he was my friend's son. God chose to say, I love you, son, and save us. As a parent, I don't know that I can do that. And yet that's exactly the passion of Jesus. Probably the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And then if you continue into verse 17 and 18, it says what? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Listen, folks, for whatever reason, we are apathetic when it comes to our salvation. Right? We wear the cross as jewelry. We look at Jesus as just another thing. And I'm going to throw a word out here, and it's going to make some of you mad, and I hope it does this morning. We, are, we feel entitled to our salvation. In our consumer society where I pick and I choose and I consume and I get, we feel entitled to it. Because, and I think it's because we've always lived on this side of salvation, right? There's nobody in this room where salvation hasn't always been a possibility. But, whether you are old earth or new earth, young earth creationist, regardless, historically speaking, salvation is a new thing. If you're young earth, you believe the earth is only 6,000 years old. Well, starting from AD 0 to 2020, guess what? There's 4,000 years where salvation is not a possibility. It's not a thing. And yet we take it for granted. We feel entitled to it. Let me tell you what you're entitled to and what you deserve. You deserve an eternity damned to hell. That's what we deserve. That's what you and I deserve. That's what we earned. That's what we're entitled to. And yet, because God is not only just, but merci merci merciful and gracious and loving, he sent his son to make sure that wasn't the only option. Look, we should be amazed that there is any option back to God, not, that they're, not upset that there's only one. And it's time as Christians that we stop taking for granted the sacrifice of Jesus, Jesus Christ on the cross, that we recognize that the price was great and that it was my price to pay. And Jesus Christ came down and paid that price for me. There, there, there comes this point where, where we just forget what it cost. We forget that Jesus became his own creation who had shunned him to be beaten and die so that he could fix what I messed up. If that doesn't cause you to stop and stand in wonder, then I'm not sure what will. A lot of you know my story. You know that I don't know my biological father. I'm actually okay with that uh, because I know who my dad is. I left his house yesterday um, and came, brought my family back. Um, but it really has helped me because now that I'm a father, I see things very differently. And you guys all that have kids, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but in no measurable way should my, is my dad my father, except for the fact that he chose to be through great personal sacrifice to himself. He loved me and my sister and my mom well. And now he loves my grandkids, or my kids, his grandkids. He loves them. Simply because he chose to, regardless of what it would cost him. 
And I can step back and I can see that. And I can recognize that through no measurable way should I be a child of God except for the fact that he chose me through great personal sacrifice to himself. There was a survey a few years ago and they asked a lot of leading pastors, hey, if you summed up the Bible in one word, one sentence, I'm sorry, one sentence, what, what, would, what would you say? And Kevin DeYoung said something that I thought was really, really fascinating. He said, the Bible is about a holy God sending his righteous son to die for unrighteous sinners so we can be holy and live happily with God forever. I don't know if you can say it much better than that. Folks, Jesus did a lot during his time on earth. But the reason he came was singular. And that was to die for you and me. And if we can't stand in wonder at that, then I wonder if we know Jesus at all. And that brings us to the third, the third wonder of Jesus that we're going to talk about this morning. And, and that's the promise of Jesus. There's hundreds of prophecies concerning Jesus and his coming. And, and we've talked about those in several different series. If you're interested in those, um, you can check out our God Question series or more recently our FAQ series where Pastor Brandon talks about those. Um, suffice it to say here that for Jesus to meet those is statistically impossible. It cannot be done. And yet it was. And the way that I can see in the New Testament, there's only two promises left. And I'm feeling pretty good about a guy who's 100% on hundreds of promises that the two are probably, probably sure things. I, it's kind of like um, when my daughter asks me for orange juice, and I say, okay, I'm going to get you orange juice, and she still asks me 47 times in the 30 seconds it takes me to get from the living room to the refrigerator. I, I've said it, I'm going to get the orange juice. And so what are those two promises? The first one I see in Philippians 1.6 with the Apostle Paul. It says, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Every day, right? We, as Christians, we're always talking about eternity. Do well, you know when, etern when eternity starts? Today. The day that you came to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's when eternity started. Eternity in that relationship with him. And so what is Jesus saying? He's saying, hey... I'm going to grow you. I'm going to mature you. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit to help you do that. I'm not, I'm not even going to ask. Listen, I came, I made your way for salvation, and now I'm not even going to ask you to mature yourself on your own. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit to do that. It's kind of like being in a group project and not doing any of the work and still getting an A. Jesus says, I've done this. I'm going to do this. You just got to show up. And then the other promise you can find these all throughout the gospel. You can find this through, in Revelation. My particular favorite is, is Acts 1, 10 through 11, because I can kind of see myself in this situation. It says, And while they're gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. Can you picture that? Like you're sitting here like, man, there goes Jesus. I don't know what's going on, what I'm going to do. And all of a sudden it's like two angels just like, what are you doing? I, if that's not student ministry. I don't know what it is. Like, there's nobody there, and all of a sudden, there's two people there going, hey, what you looking at? What you doing? Um, and, and they're like, hey, Jesus already told you what to do, Matthew 28. Go and make disciples. And then he says, men of Galilee, what, why are you looking into heaven? This Jesus who is taking up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. You saw him go up. Guess what? He's coming back, and he's not bringing orange juice. He's coming back and he is going to return victorious and he will judge every person. You guys remember the story in the Gospels where they're all sitting around the campfire and the disciples are telling Jesus who everybody says he is? Well, some people say you're Elijah. What question does Jesus ask them? But who do you say that I am? That's the question he's going to ask when he returns to each and every person. Not who did your pastor say I am. Not who did your parents. Not who did, who did you say that I was. I 
I realize that wonder is a difficult thing. I realize it takes us to stop, to slow down. And in a world where doing one more thing seems the norm, that doesn't make a lot of sense. But if anything, we've seen that things don't make a lot of sense may be exactly the reason we should slow down and wonder. And so as we wrap up this morning, it's my prayer that as we close out 2019 and head into 2020, that maybe you stand just a little bit more in awe of Jesus this morning. Maybe for the first time or the thousandth time, you can recognize that there is nothing more glorious or worthy of our time than Jesus Christ. The fact that the Creator became the created with a purpose to save a wicked people at a great personal cost and ultimately is returning again is nothing short of the greatest miracle known to mankind. And so I hope for some of us that maybe we're seeing Jesus as Lord and Savior accurately for the first time. Maybe we have finally recognized that we are a sinner that we have broken things, that our only thing that we have earned is an eternity apart from God in hell. And yet, God took care of that as well. And that all we have to do this morning is accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And our eternity with Christ can start today. For others of us, maybe it's that we've had Jesus plus for a long time. Jesus is somewhere in the mix, but it's definitely not the primary thing, and it might not even be a minor thing. It's bordering on a nothing. And some of us, we really need to clean out some space and some time and take the opportunity to look at Jesus correctly again. Because to see Jesus and to sit and wonder at Him, that is a... Lifelong journey, but every long journey starts with a single step. And so maybe if you're into New Year's resolutions, one of your resolutions this year can be to start that journey or to restart that journey. To actually maybe say no to some things so you can say yes to Jesus. Because really... The question is, are we going to place enough value in Jesus that we will stand and gaze in wonder? Or are we going to stay busy enough that it's just another year full of half-hearted Christianity that doesn't deliver on John 10.10 where it says, I have come that they may have life to the fullest. Let's pray. Dear Father God, I just pray that this morning that in a season of that can oftentimes be busy, that we would stop the busy and we would just rest in you, that we would spend time focused on you. Maybe you're sitting there and you're saying, hey, I've never really known Jesus that way, but I would like to this morning. I'd like to accept him as Lord and Savior. If that's you, would you just raise your hand for me? Trusting that everyone has made that decision, then for for the rest of us, we need to, to step back and acknowledge, do I even understand what it means to gaze and wonder at something? Do I understand what it means to be in awe? And if so, is Jesus the best and greatest thing in my life? If not, would you commit today to start the process of making him the greatest thing in your life? Would you commit the time to grow and to spend in a relationship with him? But God, this morning, most of all, as as we prepare to head home, we stand in wonder at the fact that you would die on a cross for each of us. That you would so willingly take my punishment And so, God, let that be the last thing that leaves on our hearts today. In your name we pray. Amen.
Thanks, guys. Have a great weekend and enjoy your new year.